Welcome back, everyone, to the deep dive. Today, uh, we're navigating some really interesting, possibly, you know, transformative developments, specifically in resource exploration. And yeah, the buzz around deep sea mining, you've probably seen the headlines, the rumblings about a potential U.S. executive order here. We're going to unpack what that could actually mean, especially for anyone watching the investment side. Exactly. Yeah. Our focus today is definitely on the metals company, TMC, you know, and this well, it seems like an increasing possibility of U.S. executive action really aimed at speeding up the whole permitting process for deep sea mining. And this isn't just about like cool new tech. It could seriously reshape uh, critical mineral supply chains. The whole investment picture, really. Absolutely. And just quickly for listeners maybe newer to this, TMC's main thing is harvesting battery metals, right? We're talking nickel, copper, cobalt from those polymetallic nodules way down on the seafloor. Hmm. So this potential U.S. order, it could be a huge catalyst for TMC and well, for anyone invested or thinking about it. OK, let's dig in then. What's the actual core idea behind this uh, this proposed executive order? So basically the potential order um it's really designed to cut down the permit timeline, like drastically. The U.S. is looking at its own sort of established regulatory path, specifically the Deep Sea Bed Hard Mineral Resources Act, DSHMRA, they call it. It's actually from way back in 1980. And NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, they'd oversee it. Huh, 1980. So the U.S. is kind of looking inward on this one. How does that mesh with, you know, the international efforts? Isn't there a global body for this? That's a really key point. Yes, there is. Yeah. The International Seabed Authority, the ISA, their job is regulating this stuff in international waters. And TMC, well, they've been involved with the ISA, but they've also voiced, let's say, significant frustration. They feel the ISA is just moving too slowly on finalizing the actual rules for commercial mining. Too slow for them, basically. They want to get going. That seems to be their position, yeah. They've even suggested the ISA might be, uh, their words, hostile to commercial interests. Mm -hmm. And... Look, they're not just talking. They formed a U.S. subsidiary, the metals company USA. And get this, they've already started the application process with NOAA. For exploration licenses, yes, but also commercial recovery permits. They're aiming to get those submissions in Q2 2025. Wow, okay. That's definitely putting their money where their mouth is. And the timeline difference, it's pretty significant between NOAA and the ISA, isn't it? Oh, massively different. Yeah. Under NOAA, the review process is like 90 days. That's the window. Compare that to the ISA, where the whole regulatory setup for commercial mining could potentially take maybe five years. Five years versus 90 days. OK, yeah, I see why they'd be interested in the U.S. route. Exactly. That difference is, well, it's a huge driver behind their strategy right now. All right. OK, so potential U.S. fast track. TMC is already moving down that path. Let's shift gears a bit. What does this mean for investors? What are the potential upsides, the opportunities here? Well, from an investor angle, the big argument, the main one, really hinges on strategic mineral security. Uh. We're looking at just massive projected increases in demand for metals like nickel, cobalt, copper. They're like 60% jump for nickel, 70% for cobalt, 40% for copper. It's huge. And it's all driven by you know the clean energy transition, EV batteries, renewable. Yeah, you can't build that stuff without these metals. It's fundamental. Precisely. And right now, there's this heavy reliance on... Well, certain countries, mm -hmm. like China, particularly for processing, just as an example, they handle something like 90% of rare earth refining. It's dominant. So deep sea mining, proponents say, could be a way for the U.S., its allies, to kind of diversify, mm -hmm. get more control over their own supply chains. So it's not just getting the raw stuff. It's breaking that processing dependency, too. Interesting. Exactly right. And then there's the regulatory side we just talked about, that efficiency. If they can potentially sidestep the ISA's long process, which, again, TMC sees as stalled, well, that offers a much faster route to actually starting operations. And NOAA already operates under existing U.S. law, that DSHMRA. So the path is sort of defined, legally speaking. And TMC, they're not starting from scratch with the tech, are they? You mentioned investment before. No, definitely not. They've already poured in... Uh, over $500 million developing the technology to get these nodules. That prior investment could give them a real leg up, you know, speed to market. Plus, if the U.S. gets this framework going, TMC in the U.S. could potentially grab a first mover advantage. Mm -hmm. And the market itself, seabed mining projections are putting it at over $30 billion. Yeah. It's potentially enormous. $30 billion. Okay, that's significant. Now, what about the environment? That always comes up with mining. Right. And proponents, they do make an argument there. They suggest seabed mining could actually have a lower environmental impact overall compared to traditional land mining. They talk about less deforestation, yeah. you know, less habitat destruction on land, maybe lower CO2 emissions from the extraction itself. Okay. 
So definitely some strong arguments on the strategic side, the speed, the economics, mm -hmm. but <laughs> there are always buts. What are the big risks? The challenges investors really need to get their heads around. Yeah, and this is where it gets, uh, let's say, complicated. Mm. The primary worry, no surprise, is ecological risk. The deep sea is still largely unknown territory. A lot of scientists are warning about potential irreversible damage. We just don't fully understand these abyssal ecosystems yet. What kind of damage are we talking about specifically? Well, a big one is sediment plumes. When they collect the nodules, it stirs up sediment from the seabed. These plumes could drift and potentially smother marine life, filter feeders, things like that, over huge areas. Plus, the nodules themselves, they're not just rocks. They are habitat for unique deep sea life. Removing them is direct habitat destruction. Imagine this cloud of fine dust just blanketing organisms miles away, messing up a food web that's taken maybe millennia to establish. It's delicate down there. Yeah, those sound like very serious concerns. Okay, what about the legal side? Acting outside the ISA. Diplomatic issues. Another critical point. The argument here is that going ahead without ISA approval could be seen as violating international law. Specifically, the UN Convention on the Law of the Sea, UNCLS, it's basically the rule book for the oceans. And the ISA itself is pretty clear. They see themselves as the sole regulator for the deep sea bed in international areas. So this could spark international friction, disputes maybe? It certainly could. There's a real risk of setting a precedent, you know. Other countries might think, hey, if the U.S. can do it, why can't we bypass these multilateral deals? Mm. It could lead to a kind of free-for-all fragmented approach. And then there are questions about NOAA itself. Does a national agency have the same deep expertise, the resources, as the ISA with its international scientific committees? Can they properly assess the environmental impacts? Plus, critics point out that DSHMRA, the U.S. law, is from 1980. It predates a lot of modern environmental thinking and standards. And it's not just international bodies raising flags, is it? What about local communities? No, that's right. Pacific Island communities, many of them, have voiced really strong concerns. They talk about the potential irrevocable stripping of their cultural marine heritage, feeling like they haven't been consulted on these unilateral moves. And it's worth noting, something like over 40 nations have actually publicly opposed unilateral action on this. 40 nations, wow. Okay, so if the U.S. did go it alone, what specific environmental checks might be lost by bypassing the ISA? Well, you risk losing that really robust oversight the ISA has been building. Yeah. We're talking... Detailed protocols for environmental impact assessments, EIAs, strict rules for baseline monitoring, you know, understanding what's there before you mine, and that critical expert review from the ISA's Legal and Technical Commission. It's a big piece. Without that level of international scrutiny, you could end up with, well, maybe insufficient data, limited long-term monitoring, maybe weaker enforcement. It just ups the risk of irreversible damage because maybe we didn't fully grasp the impacts beforehand. And big picture, it could weaken global environmental protections generally, undermine cooperation on saving our oceans. And this ties into climate change too, doesn't it? The bigger environmental picture. It really does. Those deep sea sediments, they store a lot of carbon. Mining could potentially disturb that, release it into the water, which isn't good for the climate. And destroying habitats means biodiversity loss. Biodiversity is key to you know, ecosystem resilience, how the planet regulates climate. And finally, just acting outside the established international framework, it could really hinder scientific collaboration, understanding these amazing deep sea places. Okay, these are definitely substantial risks, serious challenges for any investor to weigh up. Let's bring it back to TMC specifically now. What progress are they making operationally, financially? Operationally, they have hit some key milestones. They did a successful pilot processing run, yeah. turning nodules into a high-grade nickel, copper, cobalt alloy. Yeah. That was done with PMCO in Japan. And that's significant because it shows a potentially capital light approach. Using existing facilities, right? Not having to right. build hugely expensive new plants from scratch. Right, leveraging existing infrastructure. <laughs> Smart. Seems like it. And they've also made progress producing actual battery materials like nickel sulfate, potentially cobalt sulfate, purely from these nodules. That's key for the EV market. And interestingly, their process also apparently creates fertilizer byproducts, which helps with the waste angle. So the tech seems to be moving forward. What about U.S. government interest? You mentioned NOAA, but anything else? Oh, yeah, there's definitely growing interest there. Congress actually mandated a Defense Department study looking into the feasibility of refining these nodule-derived materials domestically. And TMC's U.S. arm, they've applied for a Defense Production Act, Title III grant. 
to help support building that domestic refining capability. You see support from both sides of the aisle on this, which highlights how important securing these minerals is becoming strategically. And TMC is working on the environmental monitoring side of their own operations, too. They are. They point to data from their 2022 pilot collection test. They say it suggests the sediment plume stayed fairly close to the seafloor. And they're developing something called an Adaptive Management System, AMS. The idea is to use near real-time data to actually monitor and manage environmental impacts as they operate, sort of adjust on the fly. Okay, that all sounds like positive momentum for the company itself, but what about the financials? How are they looking? Um, well, their recent reports, Q4 and full year 2024, they showed a net loss. Cash on hand was reported around $3.5 million, with total liquidity, including credit lines, around $43 million. Debt was about uh, just under $12 million. And they currently have negative shareholder equity. Analysts looking at the spending rate suggest they might need more financing, perhaps in the near term. Okay, so operational progress, yes, but investors need to keep an eye on the balance sheet and potential future funding needs. All right, let's zoom out again. Big picture. What are the broader geopolitical ripples if this U.S. executive order happens? Well, it could absolutely lead to a kind of dual track system, couldn't it? You'd have U.S. permitted mining under NOAA and then whatever the ISA eventually sets up internationally. That could mean competing standards, different rules for environmental stuff, for sharing profits. It could get messy. And you'd have to expect responses from other major players. China, for example. Could they expand export controls on seabed mining tech? They've already done it with rare earths. Right. Using economic levers. That could definitely complicate global supply chains even more. Absolutely. And we might see shifts in alliances, too. The U.S. might look to partner more closely with places like the Cook Islands, which have huge nodule fields, or Japan with its tech. On the flip side, maybe you see Russia and China coordinating more, perhaps in the Arctic, where there are also nodules. And there are other risks. Could the ISA try to impose trade sanctions on U.S. operators? What about lawsuits if sediment plumes cross from a U.S. permitted area into international waters? It opens up a lot of questions. It really sounds like it could redraw parts of the geopolitical map for resources. What about the actual markets for these metals? Could we see big supply shifts, price impacts? Yeah, that's a real possibility. If seabed production ramps up, as some projections suggest, you could see nickel oversupply. That could push prices down, really impacting traditional land-based mines. Same for cobalt. TMC's potential output is large enough that it could significantly disrupt that market too. And from an investment standpoint, you might see defense sector money flowing towards seabed sources for security reasons. But conversely, some ESG funds, those focused on environmental, social governance factors, they might specifically exclude seabed miners due to the environmental concerns we talked about. So investors have to juggle the regulatory stuff, the environmental angles, and potential commodity price shifts and changing investment flows. Yeah. It's complex. It really is. I mean, potential investors have to weigh this possibility of TMC getting a faster track via the U.S. and the undeniable opportunity in securing these critical minerals against, well, some very substantial regulatory, environmental, and, yes, geopolitical risks. It's a heavy balance. It really is a delicate balance, isn't it? You've got this urgent need for battery metals for the energy transition, and then this, this critical need to protect these deep-sea environments that we barely understand. Exactly. And how that balance ultimately gets struck, that's going to shape the future of this whole industry and its investment potential. Staying informed, really keeping up with the regulations as they evolve, the tech advancements, it's going to be crucial. Definitely a lot for our listeners to think about. Thanks so much for walking us through all of this. The metals company, the potential executive order, it's clearly got huge implications. My player. It's certainly a space to watch closely. It's developing fast. Absolutely. And for everyone listening, if you found this deep dive useful, please do subscribe so you don't miss our future explorations of market moving events. Give us a like. It really helps other listeners find the show and hit those notifications so you're always up to date. Until our next deep dive, keep exploring the depths of the market.